Are you trying to build your ministry? Do you want to be successful in the kingdom of God? Are you wanting to see your church grow? Well, first thing you have to answer is asking the question, why? Why do I want this? In this video, I want to invite you to join me as we examine our hearts in the light of God's word. And if need be, allow the sword of that same living and active word to put you through some spiritual surgery. So let's hop into it. Welcome to Never Forget the Bloods Worldwide Bloodcast. I am Brother Barry, and we're here on YouTube bringing you freedom from religious bondage by reminding you of the simple gospel. Our content is designed to encourage you in your study of God's Word and faith, to provoke you toward prayer and true spiritual worship, and to equip you to love one another. That means your enemies and your self. If you've ever experienced hindrance or hurt in your soul, we want you to know that there is liberty and healing available in Jesus Christ and that God has already and abundantly made every provision necessary for you to freely walk in this freedom. So whether you're a, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, an outreach minister, or, or even a, a, a Christian businessman, a stay-at-home mom, or just someone who's, who's seeking to figure out God's call on your life, the principles I'm going to share with you in this video will be applicable to your life in every area. That is, if you really want to follow Jesus and be his disciple. If, if you want to build your own kingdom and make a name for your own self, you need to go watch something else. But make sure on your way out, you just tap that thumbs down button twice. But if this is something that interests you, click on the, on the red letters below and subscribe for future content like this. At the end of this video and in the the description, I'm going to give some information on how to look out for toxic leadership, but I believe it's more important to distinguish what healthy leadership looks like in the beginning. So uh, what is healthy biblical leadership? How can I apply this to my own life and ministry? Well, we can find these answers by looking at the most prime example of a Christian leader. So let us now turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full into his wonderful face and then reflect his glory back onto the world. Now in the Gospel of John in chapter 13, beginning at verse 3, it says that, that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, that means he had, he had the full knowledge of who he was and what authority he actually carried, he rises from supper and, and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded and then comes Simon Peter and Peter said to him Lord do you wash my feet and Jesus answered and said to him what I do you do not know now but you shall know afterward uh, and again that that word know K-N-O-W means to be intimately acquainted with. Uh, so after he had washed their feet, verse 12, and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said to them, Know ye what I have done to you? Or, or do you understand what I have just done and why I have done it? You call me Master and Lord, and, and you say, Well, for so I am. And he's he's... He's saying it's right and proper for you to acknowledge the truth and reality. You call me your master, and that's true because I am. So if I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, if you become intimately acquainted with these things, then happy are you if you do them. Now this is the, the king of kings and the Lord of lords who created everything that is and was and shall be according to the same man who wrote the this passage, the, the apostle John. This is the son the incarnate 
word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us, who was in the beginning with God and who was God. He knew that he was about to suffer on the cross and all that that entails and that he would soon also be leaving and that his work was almost complete this time. <laughs> and so before he would delegate his authority to these men to go out and do greater works than he, this was one of the very last few lessons that he was to teach them in person before sending the Holy Spirit. So take note of that. Let's take note of that. Jesus spent his quality time pouring into just a few just a few. Did he minister to multitudes? Of course. But the, the same gospel, the same story of John tells us he didn't trust himself to the crowds. Actually, just a few chapters earlier, uh, we see the account where he intentionally ran off the, cr the large crowds because they weren't following him for the right reasons. They just wanted to get something for themselves out of the deal. He said, you all didn't even come after me on the other side of this lake because you wanted to see miracles. You just wanted a free meal. But I tell you, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have anything to do with me. And when they left, he turned to these few men and said, uh, gave them the opportunity to leave. He said, "Here, uh, there's the door, boys. You want to get out too? Here's your chance. But the promise of God stood true that all those whom the father had given him will come and nothing will snatch them from his hand and so peter answered him and said lord where else can we go you have the words of eternal life but in this demonstration of of washing the feet of his disciples we see jesus's second greatest lesson of humility and leadership the greatest and the foremost being the cross itself because a, a true leader will be humble. The Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to serve. Isaiah called him the suffering servant, and yet he is the Prince of Peace and the Wonderful Counselor. The Father had given him all authority, and he fully knew it. Did we not just read knowing, knowing that he was come from God and that he was about to leave to go back to God? And yet this fully God man rose from the table and did the job of the lowliest of servants. Remember how he said, Who, whoever wants to be the greatest among you must become the least. Whoever wants to be the first among you must become the last. He said these things to the men to whom he was going to be giving authority to turn the world upside down as apostles and ambassadors of his kingdom. And he told them, if I, being your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you must also wash one another's feet. And this washing of feet was a very dirty, demeaning job. Even if you know nothing about ancient Middle Eastern culture, you can derive from the scripture alone that, that even from John the Baptist's words saying that he, he didn't even consider himself worthy to be, unlace Jesus' sandals. And Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest prophet that ever lived. But now we see this king of glory bowing down with a towel around his waist, scrubbing off the dirt and caked camel dung, from not only the men to whom he was going to be releasing this authority to, but also to the one whom he had just announced was about to betray him. You have to be willing to still obey God despite how people treat you. You have to be faithful. If you're going to be a leader of any kind in God's kingdom, if you're, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to be faithful. You can't let other people's mistreatment of you hinder you from going after all that God has prepared and required of you. A great man of God once articulated it this way, that it, you do not have the greatest capacity for hurt because you do not have the greatest ability to love, but God does. God, specifically here, God the Son, had the greatest vulnerability to clean the toenails of the one who was about 
to sell him for the price of a slave. And Jesus says, If I, being your master, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Now, there are some Christians who have taken this very literally and have included in their liturgy of ordinances to make foot washing a part of their regular practices. And, and I will say that this is a, this can be a very beautiful thing. I, I've been a part of services like that. But there's some things, if you make a, a practice out of it, if you make it a standard, you know, it, it's potential that you could miss the heart of it entirely. If you are priding yourselves on the fact that you believe and practice in literal foot washing, well, if it's stirring up pride in you, you've missed the you've missed it, and you're you're not actually washing feet the the way that Jesus actually taught. I mean, furthermore, if you think of any act of service that makes you worthy of anything, you've missed it. On the contrary, it, the reality is that after you have done all that is commanded you, you must fall down on your face and cry out for mercy and because you're an unworthy servant because you only did all that was commanded of you. No, flip it around, my friend. God has already made you a king and a priest. You are fully accepted and cherished, adopted into his family already. And the proof of that is that you've repented and believed in Jesus. You don't need to do anything to prove yourself. You don't need to try and be somebody. You already are somebody because God has chosen you. If you are his child, if you have believed on the cross and the blood and the empty tomb, you are accepted in the beloved right now already, never to be taken away. <laughs> he already rejoices over you because Jesus fulfilled everything required of you on your behalf. But now, if you have realized your identity if you realize this reality of who you are in Christ because of what Jesus has done, then that means you can now be free to serve with real humility. That means recognizing being honest about your gifts and not being ashamed of them but also acknowledging your weaknesses and not being ashamed of them because in our weaknesses, His strength is perfected and His grace is sufficient for us. You are not going to be sufficient in yourself. If you're going to be a leader, you're going to need a team. And, and that's where Acts chapter 7 comes in with the appointing of deacons. Um, you know, the, the church had grown so much so quick that the apostles knew the apostles knew the importance of uh, of serving the poor and the widows but they knew they couldn't do everything all by themselves they just had 3000 people get saved in one day so <laughs> therefore they sought out to appoint seven other men to handle some of those things and that doesn't mean those things were unimportant serving the the widows and orphans was was something of a very high priority for the early church uh, if you want proof for that, the, the scripture says that, that these seven men had to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Friends, that means in the New Testament church, you weren't even counted worthy to spoon out potato salad at the potluck unless you were markedly filled with the Holy Spirit. And so in Acts chapter 7, yes, we see a paradigm shift in delegating responsibilities based upon gifts and strengths. But it's all based on the same heart of servanthood that we see in John 13. That means that a good leader is able to recognize that he's not equipped to do something. That means that a good leader is going to be able to freely and humbly and honestly admit that he's weak in something that he can't handle it. Because friends, there's a whole lot of freedom in not having to be somebody. If your goal, if your heart is of service to Jesus, you don't need to take control of everything. You don't need to worry about your image. <laughs> you just serve. And if you're not equipped for it, find someone else to do it. And if that means that you got to step down so that 
the people can be served so that God's people can be served so that, I mean, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, divorce your wife if you don't think you're a good husband, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like friends, come on. I'm talking like in leadership, you use these principles. Okay. A good leader will delegate responsibilities based on gifts and strengths. But, and also furthermore, a good leader will seek to raise up other leaders. He's not going to try to control everything himself for the rest of his life. He's going to be trying to find someone to turn things over to because this time is limited. We, you, I mean, you have to be pouring yourself out and raising others up. Jesus said in the parable that the, the kingdom of God is like a mustard plant that takes over the whole garden. Or friend, if you've just got one branch that's try, trying to be the strongest branch, you're not going to take over the whole garden. You're just going to be a log sitting there. And then you're going to rot and die. So we have to be seeking the increase of the kingdom of God from glory to glory to ever increasing glory. Amen. A good leader will delegate. A good leader will pour into others and seek to lift others up. So I, I hope to go into some more detail on the, on the flip side of this and how toxic leadership actually fails to serve people. Uh, but in this video, I just wanted to really hone in on uh, just, uh, you know, some of the aspects of a healthy leader based on uh, Jesus' example in John 13. But if you want to help me out and, and just uh, put in the comments, um, you know, which of the following that, that you'd like uh, me to get into next on the, on the content of toxic leadership uh, from examples in the Bible. Uh, and I'll put the scripture references in the description, but we're uh, Diotrephes. He loved to have the preeminence among them. Saul's jealousy of David. Um, and then in uh, the book of Kings, there's an older prophet that deceived a younger prophet. Uh, and then, of course, there's uh, Ahab and Jezebel. And if you go to our channel and scroll down to the shorts shelf, then uh, you'll you'll be seeing some clips and quotes uh, addressing these things uh, taken from some older videos that we've already released. But for now, just uh, click up on one of these videos that's going to pop up on the screen for a second for more encouragement in your faith. And friends, until next time, just see to it that no man steal thy crown and never forget the blood. Yeah.